There is a Reaper, Losing a Child to Cancer, written by Michael Lines, narrated by Gerald Zimmerman. Forward. I don't know why I'm writing this. It likely will never be read by any other person. I'm doing it entirely for myself, in memoriam of a life well lived, a son sorely missed and greatly mourned. Some would say his life was too short, or that he never had a chance. Oh, what might have been! I say he lived his life as fully as any man, woman, or child on this earth. It was his life, and it was complete, and it was perfect. Something woke her, powerful, sub-vocal, a call, a command. Now! Across the dimly lit room she saw his head drooped awkwardly against the pebbled plastic rail, and she rose and, gently, for movement meant pain, lifted him and laid him softly back. She stood beside him, silent, waiting. Be present. Bear witness. His eyes, bottomless black pools, veiled that long night by sleep, veiled too long by pain, opened. He sat up, and his hand rose, outstretched, reaching. Instinctively she grabbed his hand and held it wordlessly. Slowly he laid back down, black pools open and alert, a look on his face almost of elation, of bliss. Breath now drawn in, deep filling his chest, and out. His hand loosed, his body eased, his face relaxed. Breath, softer now, in just a memory, a reflex, and out, a last leave-taking to a well-loved, well-used, and familiar friend, my old home. Till then, soft breathed in, so soft, almost silent, almost sacred, it is finished. Soft, out, out, free free released, free. His mother waited, watching it end. Outstretched, his hand fell finally to rest. She bore unflinching witness. Four Poem There is a reaper whose name is Death, and with his sickle keen he reaps the bearded grain at a breath, and the flowers that grow between. Shall I have naught that is fair, saith he, have naught but the bearded grain? Though the breath of these flowers is sweet to me, I will give them all back again. He gazed at the flowers with tearful eyes, he kissed their drooping leaves, it was for the Lord of Paradise he bound them in his sheaves. My Lord has need of these flowerets gay, the reaper said and smiled. Dear tokens of the earth are they, where he was once a child. They shall all bloom in fields of light, transplanted by my care, and saints upon their garments white, those sacred blossoms wear. And the mother gave in tears and pain the flowers she most did love. She knew she should find them all again in the fields of light above. Oh, not in cruelty, not in wrath. The reaper came that day. T'was an angel visited the green earth and took the flowers away. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Chapter 1 whose name is Death. I remember the first time I saw him. Before he even had a name, he lay on one side, naked, bloody, and exhausted on his mother's chest, big feet searching for familiar, contoured softness, warm, kind darkness, replaced by cool, alien light, half-muffled sounds. He was our second son, his brother, Ian, three years his senior, was at Grandma's. Mom and Dad had rushed off to the hospital. The happy event of the birth of our second child had finally come. 
I remember that first time him laying there with the skin of his chest half-pressed to Margaret, amniotic fluid still plastering his dark, curly, newborn hair to his gently pulsing scalp. He opened his eyes. Black, black pools, seemingly without pupil or iris, and looked at me, at us. It was the same look those eyes would hold throughout his life, intense scrutiny, frank appraisal, direct, unflinching, powerful, fearless. Flesh, infinite night, and gone. I'm sure I noted it, brief though it was, and later, when he has been warmed and cleaned and wrapped mummy-like in soft cotton and all of us resting from our labors, real and vicarious, we paused and hugged each other and started to consider in our way what name should this child be given. Some background. Margaret and I have our ways, and they may be strange to you, but we like them. We decided long ago, not really, but it seemed so then in our youth, long, that for each of our children we would do certain things. First, never in that day of the instant stonogram image did we want to know the sex of our children prior to their birth. We like surprises. Second, we keep our own counsel, our very private, and believe that the best secret is one not shared. When we became pregnant for the second time, our firstborn was about two years old. We told no one other than Dr. C., Margaret's OBGYN, and Virginia, Margaret's mother, and not coincidentally, a registered nurse with 15 years of experience in labor and delivery working with the aforementioned Dr. C. So, with no one else the wiser, we three, nay, four, plugged along till about halfway through the second trimester, when the obvious gave us away. We also like being surprising. Third, we would not engage in the common practice of choosing names prior to meeting our offspring. We thought it presumptuous to prejudice ourselves one way or another. A relative, friend, saint, or sinner, names are important things we knew, and to choose a name sight unseen was not our way. We like to meet our children, see them as they are, and then choose for them the name they will bear throughout their lives. It works that way for us. So there we sat together in one bed so we could, head over shoulder, both gaze at the book of names we had brought with us to the hospital. Our nameless baby Lines was not present. He was sleeping soundly after his great exertions, but we had seen and held and observed and we were ready to call him as we saw him. We read and spoke and pronounced and considered. There were many names. In between we discussed what we had each perceived about his new life. The eyes, the look, were mentioned, and we focused on those dark portals. I forget who said it first, which means to say it was Margaret about his eyes. He has a look about him so intense, she said. Hmm, I said, employing my rapier wit. He looks right through you like a challenge. Like his mother, I said. Tired as she was from her own struggle, she inflicted only superficial burns and minor flesh wounds on me for that. When order was restored, we reconsidered the book, the eyes, the soul, so embodied still needed a name. Christopher, she said. He who bears Christ, that's his name. There was no Christopher in the family. My sister Chris is a teen, not a fur. And it really fit. I repeated it after her, out loud, to get the feel of it. Christopher. I like it. It sounds solid and strong, but it needs a middle name to match. 
We also like middle names and meanings. Told you we have our ways. Back to the book. More names, more pronouncements. And we asked ourselves, asked him, in absentia, Christopher, what middle name do you need? What name could be strong enough for those dark pools, that intense energy, that challenge, that strength of body and character force? Abruptly, it jumped out from the page. Aaron, mountain, brother of Jesus, strong, solid, profound. Christopher Aaron Lines. It seemed the lock, a steady beat of a name, a march of a name. It fit him, the eyes, the look. Christopher Aaron he would be. And in our youth and folly, little did we realize how well we had chosen.